What's going on, everybody? This is James Grandmaster Facts Boys, and you're here for another episode of the Facts Project. Today, very special guest, second time on the program, Renton Hawkey. We're here talking about Tower of Doom, his first exclusive Kickstarter, everybody. Thank you for being here. Mr. Boyce, Grandmaster, always nice to see you. <laughs> always a pleasure, brother. So when ultimately, when this dropped, even the landscape of us, of you even like having this preview, I was like, the last time we talked, there was a, of course, the, the the scope of our talk was that you did so much digitally. You were moving from Webtoons to Substack and you were doing Ronin Digital Express into this web series that you were building for Substack. And it was almost like we never even fathomed even a portion of our talk around the fact that maybe you wanted to do something with Kickstarter and put something out independently to where I could get something in print and put it on my wall. Yeah. What yeah. happened? You know, it's, um, it wasn't really what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I kind of always thought maybe someday if like the web comic ran for long enough, maybe I would like collect volumes and see if I could get anything out of Kickstarter with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, this came together specifically because uh, I was invited to contribute to an anthology. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, they initially approached me and they wanted to grab like a chapter from what I had already done. And I was like, well, if you're going to invite me, I'll just do something brand new uh, that like nobody's seen before. Um, but they like Ronin Digital Express, so it had to be within that world. Right. Um, so yeah, I just, I just did a new thing. It's like a new 20 page one shot. It's completely self-contained. It has its own plot. I mean, if you like the web comic, um, you'll like this, but if you have no idea what the web comic is, but you like samurai stuff and manga and Westerns and stuff like that, you will like this and you don't need to have read the web comic first. Yep. But uh, yeah, so that was the idea. Just like make a one shot that's like a nice intro piece for anybody who hasn't read the webcomic or likes the webcomic and wants more of it. Um, and then that just fell through. And um, someone just was like, why don't you just do it yourself? I think like, one of the guys who worked on that project and was the editor was like, why don't you just try it, go out on your own and do a Kickstarter for this and throw together a couple of prints. And I've talked, I talked it over with a couple of other artist friends and they were like, yeah, like just, uh, it's not that hard. Just pull together a quick campaign, see what, you know, see what you're worth, see what happens. And yeah. I was just like, oh, okay, sure. Why not? And here we are. Now, before any of this, have you ever thrown any of your work into print? This would be the first time. I mean, I've done some, I've done some short comics uh, that have been printed in like other collections before. Mm -hmm. Like I have like a, I have a credit as a writer in like a, a caliber presents anthology. Okay. From several years back. Um, and then, uh, my friend Milton Lawson is a writer and he had yeah. like a three issue. Yeah. He had like a three issue miniseries um, called uh, Thompson Heller. Um, I cannot remember the publisher for the life of me. And this is the second time I've been on a podcast and I forgot the publisher but it's okay uh, milton lawson milton lawson i remembered him this time um yes. yeah so he's my friend i did a short comic for that project it ended up in the trade so mm. there are like a couple little bits here and there that you could have picked up in print but anything that's like fully mine uh no this would be the first time now are you still attached to this anthology that you were pretty much going to put this out for no, that fell through. Um, yeah. And it's just one of those things. Nobody's yeah. fault. Um, yeah, just didn't come together. Mm. So necessarily in the past, you've uh, you've attached yourself to some anthologies to where you've wanted to lend some of your talents to. Um, do you feel as though the way that this one shot is gone? No, you were probably funded within, what, five days? Pretty quick, yeah. I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, it's been... The, the whole we're in the, like the last week now right and the uh the the old the old saw about how it's it's like a lot happens all at once and then there's like nothing in the middle and then at the end it starts to pick up again starts to pick up again yeah. that has been that has been true um so but yeah i was very fortunate to uh have gotten pretty much across the finish line 
uh, pretty early. So yeah. yeah, I mean, we're there. I've added a couple of other, you know, bits and bobs to it to try to entice people along. Uh, we're still sitting on the fence, but yeah, did, mm-hmm. did pretty well. Very, very happy about that. Good. Now, necessarily, you're still on Substack. Uh, Ronan yeah. Digital Express is, of course, uh, a 30 a thirty episode or 30 issued uh, web comic that you put out. Thereabouts, yeah. Mm-hmm. About 30. Um, yep. so, so is that still in continuation? Or are you looking to basically uh, finish an arc and start a new one? Well, so, yeah, I think that um, I think that the the one shot that's on Kickstarter right now will end up being kind of an interesting artifact in the history of this web comic. Okay. Uh, because the web comic is full color. It's uh, if you printed it out, it would be like the traditional comic size. Yeah. So the one shot is manga sized mm. and, and I'm not doing color. I did just screen tones and black and white and all that. And I liked that approach so much uh, that I'm going to do that from now on. So this is almost like a prototype for what's, you know, once I pick things back up on Substack, what the future is going to look like. Um, And I'm going to like reboot it. So, you know, everything that I've already done has been just kind of like a prototype. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're going to reboot it. We're going to do like a long running, you know, true epic. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this will kind of be like a, uh, maybe like a little nightcap for people who liked it so far, but also kind of a preview of coming attractions. That's what I was about to say. Is this now going to be almost a precursor into arc two? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to more or less reboot it and start like a, uh, you know, a proper story. Um, And I've put together, you know, the many years to come plan for that. Mm-hmm. um and uh yeah it's gonna it's gonna be more manga style i think just because it's a little bit easier on the workflow i mean i've said before that coloring is about as much work as everything else combined so, absolutely yeah absolutely. so if you can drop if you can drop that out of your process um it helps uh but i also like the artistic challenge of doing it in manga because you know you have to really worry about uh composition and shape and value a lot more so it's still a challenge but uh it's kind of a fun challenge and there are a lot of sections in in tower of death where where i got to do stuff that was like pretty creative that i don't think i would have thought to do with like full color with full color i'm thinking like i'm almost thinking of it like a movie or like tv where i've got to like fill a panel or fill a scene but like if it's black and white i can do like more expressive silhouettes or you know frank miller type shit it's a lot of fun Now, as far as your your lead character, now you you basically um, have been able to uh, add growth and a lot of detail to the character of uh, Ronan Waruhito. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, well, it's uh, he's he's sort of a man with no name type. Uh, right. and a lot of people who have read it have just kind of attached a name. You know, just, yeah, random stuff from the. Uh, um you know the story to him and that so that's yeah why hito is fine too uh, how do why are we he to why are we he to is japanese for just bad guy bad guy yeah so that's the it, character the, the mario character wario is uh i think in japanese it's what are we or something like that and that's where i, I got that from so that's dope yeah. that, now as far as like the you, you've you've drawn this character time and time again how much attachment uh, uh, as far as like uh as far as the character itself, do you feel like it, it is totally enamored in your personality? How, how much of you is in, is in this character? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know how much he's me. Um, but he definitely deals with stuff that i resonate with and i mm-hmm. so if you look at like the web comic i think if i could the web comic itself is pretty serialized so each episode kind of just stands on its own there's not really a big over overarching story necessarily it's kind of just you know kung fu um yeah. that sort of a thing but, you know, there's a bit of a thread throughout thematically, I think, where it starts off where he's just sort of your classic Western 
coming in from middle of nowhere badass right and yep. just uh, you know he's clearly a competent expert with a sword and just you know ultimate badass type and um he carries himself that way but i think over the course of the web comic you start to see some holes get poked in that and there's a little bit more vulnerability going on with him in the subtext and um a little bit more fear i think and so then by the end the sort of climax of the sub stack comic thus far is uh he takes a a gig from like a fortune teller type lady yeah uh, to go get her fortune telling thing back and so he goes he kills a bunch of bad guys and then he grabs her thing back and the only reward he wants is he just wants her to tell him what the future is for him like what how's it all going to turn out for me and um you know she's just kind of like you know you know what's going to happen right and he's just like yeah i guess so and he goes on his way and then her buddy uh you know her traveling companion is like you know hey we were lucky like guys like that you can't fuck around and um she says this thing that's really important where she says um he's not a bad guy he's a kid in trouble Mm -hmm. and i think that that that's something i resonate with because i think that there is a lot of like you know we try to carry ourselves around in society uh tougher than we really are yeah and uh so yeah there's stuff like that that i think i resonate with with him um i think when we get into the next thing um there's going to be his big kind of quest is going to be around he has a really set idea in his mind of what he's got to do Mm -hmm. uh, what his the meaning of his life is uh and he's just wrong you know and that's also very relatable you know we get very fixated on one thing or another and we're like this is the answer and we're wrong we can't see that we have to experience it and that's how we grow right right so yeah i put them in situations that are like that that i think are relatable to me and are interesting um but yeah as far as like his personality being my personality not so much i kind of like keeping him a little bit of an arm's distance um and just because i i want him to be a little bit mysterious to me too uh so yeah very roundabout answer to your question but no and it's it's highly noticeable because i remember in like the first i say the first six episodes of Ronin Digital Express, you know, it was, it was all action. You know, he yeah. was, he was kicking ass left and right. And then there was like, okay, you know, there's more to him than what the, this pencil thin exterior can give. I mean, you can actually break through and see a little bit more of who this person is. Yeah. You know, like regardless if he's kicking ass the entire time, he has a belief system as to why, what he's kicking ass for. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah. And it doesn't, a lot of times it doesn't take a lot, especially if you're, you're dealing with someone who's kind of emotionally immature and I'm like, you know, this character is a young guy, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. I think that when you are in your early twenties or whatever it is, like you feel like you have it figured out, but then once you get to thirties, you're like, I didn't know shit, you know? Uh, And he, so he's still, you know, in that kind of pupate stage of just fake it till you make it you know, uh-huh. with, his, with his life. And uh, with guys like that, I think who are, who are tough guys, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of poking to see what's going on in there. And it's then, true. Yeah. And that's kind of something I want to, that's the humanity I want to draw out of him, I think. And, and, you know, I want him to be, I want people reading it to be like, you know, yeah, this guy's a badass. This is awesome. But then also to kind of see like, oh, like he's, there's other stuff all- going on and that's okay. You know? Yeah. Right. Can't be that person all the time. No, yeah. no. But no. now, um, you, when you first began um, this this journey into basically this character in this comic, uh, of course, you chose the the cult classic genre of spaghetti westerns. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it was Eastwood or Kurosawa or um, those 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 Italian westerns, uh, what was it Sergio Sergio Leone? Yeah, so Leone Corbucci is another big one. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, of course, that has, of course, this this legendary cult following. And Mm -hmm. now how has the reception been for people that love that genre to what you were creating when you described it in that way? Yeah, that's a good question. I like whenever I talk about spaghetti westerns and I talk about 
tropes, uh, you know, from spaghetti Westerns. And I think like what's, what's interesting about like a spaghetti Western versus like an American Western is a spaghetti Western is way more of a comic book. Like yeah, there's like just slow budget. Yeah. It's low budget. The, there's characters who like, I mean, the original Django, like the original Django from like the sixties, not, mm-hmm. you know, where, where Django Unchained comes from. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's like, he pulls out a machine gun in like the first 30 minutes and just like mows down all these like right. KKK dudes, you know, and you're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's just all this random stuff in this movie. And it's, it's like a pulp novel or like a diet, like a penny novel or something like that. It's just, there's all these extremely dramatic elements in it. Um, so yeah, I like, I like the spaghetti Western a little bit more because they take those chances. They're a little more camp in a way that's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if I talk about like, oh, I love spaghetti Westerns and I love, you know, Clint Eastwood, uh, I love Kurosawa. I love old Sam, you know, black and white samurai movies. Mm-hmm. Um, people vibe with that. Like people are like, oh yeah, that stuff is awesome. Um, I don't know if it totally shows in the work as much as I want it to. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, as far as like, Hey, that's the soup that I'm playing in. That's the stuff that inspires me. That's always what I'm trying to emulate. Um, I haven't really gotten a lot of not a lot of people were like, eh, it's boring. It's not my thing. Even though I don't really, I don't feel like I see a lot of that in comics. I so. don't think so. The people, yeah. people know their niche and they follow it. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, like there's, there's definitely like in like European comics, like there's a lot more like Western comics over there. Like that's a, I think because like maybe in America, it's just our genre and we're kind of, you know, oversaturated with it or have mm-hmm. been we take it for granted, but then it's kind of exotic in Europe, you know, cause they don't have, it's true. It's not their country, you know? So, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's still our popular like Western, that's a popular genre for comics across, you know, overseas, but, um, yeah, I don't see a whole lot of it here. So I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's like a, a, a vein there to be tapped into here, uh, or revived or not. Uh, but people seem to, people seem to like the influences when I talk about the influences. It's true. It's true. Now, um, generally, like I say, just comic books in general, um, people understand the weirdness. They love they love that that version in comic books. They like the corniness. They like the exaggerated stuff about it and everything like that. When that translates to like, say, a medium like a movie where the action sequences like like what you were talking about with Django, where Basically, we're talking about a a, a storyline, a setting that is almost like 1920s. It might even be 1880s. And somebody pulls out a machine gun, which probably isn't even invented yet and blows away half the damn cast. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so it's like, do you feel like uh, when when it's done in comics, it's done properly because it's it's almost it should be notated in those type of mediums. But when it's done in like a movie. Uh, where something is totally exaggerated and really corny like mm-hmm. is it actually respected in that way because they're figuring this is just going to build a great action scene or is it just corny <laughs> that's a good question I, uh, I for me for me when I spot that kind of anachronistic weird stuff in like an older movie mm-hmm. like a 60s or 70s movie I, I think it's kind of exciting because I, I think that my I think that my expectation of like an older movie is it's going to be like, maybe the dialogue is going to be really good. Right. But it's going to be kind of slow. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to either be in it right away, or I'm probably not going to get into it, you know, um, as a film nerd, maybe I can appreciate it, but um, not as fast paced as what we have today. Not as well choreographed. You know, there's a lot of just like, it's true. You know, guys getting grazed on the chin and then fainting type stuff in the fight scenes. Uh, so, you know, um, you can appreciate it for what it is. But yeah, so yeah, when I see something that wild in a movie from like 1966, it's, it's, I like it a lot. But, you know, to your point, I mean, there's probably like, you know, dozens of straight to DVD movies from the last 20 years that mix ninjas and cowboys and whatever else. And absolutely. And, you know, and they probably, some of them are probably fun in, you know, in their own way, but you know, Mm -hmm. they're, they're the B movies of our time. Um, So there might be some gems in there, but are they going to stand the test of time the way like Django does? I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. Cause sometimes there's even some of those subcultures like, uh, like Grindhouse, 
Mm -hmm. right? like 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 uh when tarantino did like death race and stuff yeah. like that uh to where the some of the sequences and uh, the action sequences or even just the settings in general just turned out to be like holy shit is this really happening <laughs> right one, it probably, you know, that's a good point. Cause I mean, like the grindhouse movies were like a step above pornography in the seventies, you know, I mean, Correct. like it's that people, what is this shit? You know, like this isn't art, this isn't anything. This is just garbage, mm -hmm. but you know, Tarantino it, as a kid or, you know, young guy moving, working in a movie store, I forget what his origin story was, but you know, he loved that stuff. So yeah. maybe that's all it takes is for some kids today who are, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, catching these movies on Netflix or wherever they have ended up, um, you know, or their parents work a lot and they go rent them some movies from, you know, the last few movie stores and they just get the cheap dollar ones or whatever. And those are the straight to DVD ones. And that's what they're growing up on. Um, yeah, maybe they'll, some of them will end up being, you know, genuine artists and, and do a love letter to movies like that. And then that will be, you know, that'll like redeem them in retrospect. I think that's totally possible. That's true. Now, as far as Tower of Death is concerned, exactly how much uh, how much of the 30 episode webcomic, although it's outside of that, um, what exactly is the premise for Tower of Death? What are you trying to say within 22 pages? Yeah. So Tower of Death um, is a pretty simple story. Uh, so you're just going to follow this. It's a simple story and you rely a lot on like tropes, right? Uh, because okay. it's 20 pages. It's a standalone story. You kind of have to get everything you need right away in that 20 pages. So it's about two pages of exposition. And then it's about 18 pages of fighting for his life. Um, and the the setup is just... Very straightforwardly, our unnamed Ronin character protagonist from the webcomic wanders into a, you know, drugged in orgy party thing being thrown by some local crime lord. So it's, it is a little grindhouse, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, funny, funny that you said that. Um, and uh, he just goes in there and he's like, you know, hey, I'm here for what's mine. What is he talking about? We don't totally know yet. Right. Um, has a little bit of an argument with the crime boss. Crime boss six his, you know, ninja assassin goons on him. And there's like one bad guy in there who's like a seven foot tall, you know, samurai cyborg dude. Uh, and yeah, he just, uh, he just gets wailed on for the next 18 pages. And, um, you know, there are a few times where it looks like maybe he's not going to get back up and uh, mm -hmm. he does. And then by the end, you know, you figure out what he's there for. There's a bit of a twist. There's a bit of an emotional uh, component to it um and uh and yeah and then there's just the final the final pages where um i mean i don't want to give it away but uh yeah it's a, i think it's not a good if, ending i'm gonna say not if it's going in the arc too you can't give anything away right 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 no it'll it'll stand alone it'll be on its own thing there'll be like little hints uh, not i, I don't want to say hints but there'll be like things like uh property damage let's say like uh if he has like a, a certain gunshot wound in his poncho mm -hmm. he will have that from now on uh so there'll be continuity like that right. for sure um but yeah as far as like do you need this for the next thing not necessarily like it, it should just be like a fun thing that stands on its own and it tells a complete story so i mean what were your impressions of it i sent you a i did send you a, re a review copy didn't i yes you did and yeah. and to be honest like the action in there is fucking really intense <laughs> um i act i really like the antagonist like the the crime boss that you had basically like running the show with in this little like den and everything like that reminded me of like those um I, yeah I'm, I'm thinking of like run run shawl type kung fu flicks sure yeah uh, to where you know you got to fight every single henchman i have the dude before me is probably stronger than me mm -hmm. but which is pretty much like the seven foot cyborg dude that you got to right. fight them pretty right. much. And then, and then it's me and I, yep. I can barely do anything to you, but you know, I tend to get my licks off because you're at your weakest. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had him, I, I had kind of like a, a picture in my head of like, he needs to be like Kim Jong Un slash George Costanza. That's what I said. I like, I like that about him. 
Yeah, and he and he has like a Russian tracksuit and all this like gaudy jewelry and stuff like that. He's yeah. a cornball. So. He's like a dude in the laundromat that like runs the laundromat. <laughs> totally, totally. But like you see him, you know he's the bad guy. Like just at a glance. So that's like what I meant by like the tropes is like the characters are so like once you lay and there's like a there's a female character in it, which you know we don't want to get yep. too much away. But there's like a femme fatale kind of character, and it's mm-hmm. like as soon as you see these characters, you register exactly what role they're going to play yeah. in the story right. just based on how they look. Yeah, bad guy. <laughs> yep right 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 you, it, big ass big big seven foot tall cyborg asshole avoid that guy <laughs> right yeah. it, and i also noticed that you you did give the bag uh like well I, I forget his name but you you gave him your glasses oh yeah 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 yeah. there's a yeah yeah that was on purpose it was, <laughs> that, was that had to be on purpose there's a little bit of that there's i mean it, we we talked about tarantino before doesn't he get his head blown off every time he does like a cameo in his own he movie? does uh, yeah, i mean so. from dust till dawn he turned into a dan he turned into a snake <laughs> yeah that's right yeah. so yeah i don't know yeah i don't know what that is the, the little ma- and there's a little bit of masochism there maybe but uh yeah no i like the uh i do like the colored glasses that's true for sure for sure now as far as this ability to um reach a certain way that you wanted to tell this type of story. Is there possibly a genre out there that you wanted to dive into next? Well, I'm working on, um, I'm in the middle of something else right now. I'm working on, I've talked about it online a few places, so it's not, you know, I'm not going to do the thing where it's like, oh, super secret project coming up. I can't talk about it, but I can't wait to Mm -hmm. tell you. Comic creators, please, for the love of God, don't say that stuff. It is so, it is so annoying. I it hate is. that. I hate the vague posting. Like I have an announcement. I'm excited about it. I can't tell you yet. Before social media existed, you would have no you never knew for that. Yeah, yeah. It just it, it it came out with the announcement. Just wait for the announcement, please, please. Mm-hmm. I beg you. So anyway, I have talked about this, so I'm not going to do the thing where I'm like I can't talk about the project yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm working on another Substack comic, which and it'll be a self-contained graphic novel um and it's so like about the length of like a three issue miniseries like 80 pages tops Mm. or something okay um and yeah it's going to be it's called fistful of yen and it's going to be literally the clint eastwood character from the mixful of dollars yep i remember i remember the post right with the toshiro mifune ronin character from yojimbo Mm -hmm. and anybody who doesn't know fistful of dollars is like a pretty unofficial remake of yojimbo which is like a japanese samurai movie yeah they're like it's like a shot for shot remake it's it's nuts but anyway um i'm just gonna imagine that one of the directors approached the other in the 60s and was like why don't we like bring these two guys together and do like a team-up movie and so this comic will be like that team-up movie so mm-hmm. I'm I'm in the middle of working on that right now so that will be like a, an official spaghetti western slash kurosawa samurai movie genre comic that i'm working on i can't sell it because i'm violating tons of ip infringement right so the best i can do is just put it out there for free um which is what i'm gonna do Mm -hmm. and uh yeah once that's over i'll go back to ronin digital express we'll kick that thing off proper for the next several years and yeah i've got a couple other things that i might do in the margins i would like to do like spy stuff a little bit um but uh, yeah, nothing really, nothing with enough sex appeal to talk about here just yet. But gotcha. you know, just an interest in that genre. Now, has it ever occurred to you because um, because of how you you trained to translate yourself into being this comic book creator, but yet you are a definitive movie geek? So it's like you never really like saw yourself you you create characters that are more human than anything but you don't necessarily do want to dive into anything that's basically superheroes capes and cows right yeah not really um right. i had kind of like a i mean like if if marvel came to me and was like yeah you know if i if i had enough recognition on the indie scene where they were like just pitch us something Mm -hmm. um i'd I'd probably find something i could do like maybe i would pitch them like a star wars story or something that's like off in its own corner of the galaxy so i don't have to worry about continuity too much 
yeah and that's it's kind of a natural fit for like you know my western slash samurai sensibilities i could do that and even the way that star wars is going it's not everything's not lightsabers and jedis right right so you there's know, a lot and or and it's like probably like the most distinct I, i'd say largest personal piece of uh subtext for the empire that i've seen in a show yeah how like it was it, how what a weird experience it was just to see like the bureaucracy of running the empire. Right. You almost like, saw how terrifying it was for everybody else in the galaxy. It's terrifying, but also like within the empire, it's like, oh my God, these are a bunch of like career Idiot. bureaucrats who hate their job. And you know, they're like, How are we what are we doing here? You know, it's yeah. it's it's it was so uh I don't know, whatever you know, you've seen all the critiques of it and like, this is, you know, empire and that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was, an, it was an interesting angle on it, but, um, yeah, where was I? Oh yeah. So if I, you know, I could, I'll, I could probably come up with like a star Wars thing, but as far as like the, uh, the legacy characters, uh, not really. And then also like doing my own superheroes again, I just kind of feel like the language is so, almost everybody who's doing that it's it just inevitably is derivative of batman or something else and like some of them have really cool angles like i i i, I know a guy a little bit uh named uh dan scotty who mm -hmm. has a he's got a webtoon called lavender jack um which is pretty pulpy it's good it's it's yeah. definitely worth reading uh but his the thing that i came across with him initially was he had like a superhero character called the foul and he was like a Batman looking character but with a big like bird beak on his face. It sounds nuts, but it actually looked pretty cool. Okay. Um, but this was like Batman with multiple personality disorder was, oh. was like the pitch. And so like, there's interesting, there's interesting ways to do it. You know, I'm not, I'm not shaming anybody who's, who's mm -hmm. set on superheroes and they know they're doing something derivative, but they have their own twist on it. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. I just, I just can't think of a way to do it. It's not interesting to me. I, 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 for some reason, I kind of figured uh, you would be somewhat of someone that wanted to attach themselves to a street level character. Yeah, I mean, if 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 I if push came to shove, it would have to be somebody like Daredevil or something like that. Right. Like well, someone see, who someone who gets the snot kicked out of them regularly. For sure. I wasn't even thinking of that. I was thinking of like Horshack from Watchmen. Oh, I don't know if I would want to spend a lot of time in that guy's head. <laughs> <laughs> He's got issues <laughs> for real. If, if, yeah, if people yeah, yeah. understand exactly who that who he really is and what his what his like values core values are, he's nuts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because he's the only character in Watchmen who cares about what's true. Mm -hmm. But like, that's like the only redeeming quality he has. Everything else is like, yeah, yeah. touch grass, bro. <laughs> <laughs> bro, man, look. Uh, as far as um substack is concerned and how it's built itself as a medium and you've of course when substack did its launch it was like more so like yeah i'm gonna put my comic here and substack as a as a brand and as an app and as a company has grown a little bit even to yeah. the point where it's annoyed some other apps like twitter like even yeah. their their social media app like it was like it was like bro you think you could be like us because you're doing notes now like what the, and it was right, like that. right but to be somebody that like literally has has a lifeline on substack what do you think of the medium now um i like it i think it's still definitely uh in its formative stage it's not it's not really some something yet mm -hmm. the way like twitter was really something um, and Twitter, you know, Twitter is kind of like, uh, I still use Twitter. I think, mm -hmm. we, you know, yeah. anybody who, anybody who's pretending like they've gone to Mastodon or Hive or whatever is still tweeting at, you know, this is true, whichever elected official they hate the most, uh, you know, so we're all still using it. It's still useful for now. It's okay to admit that, but it is kind of like, um, it is kind of like Goldie Hawn and Meryl Streep at the end of, uh, Death Becomes Her. Yes. Uh, it feels that way you know like it's just kind of it's it's just going to take a little push for for this to fall apart um but yeah no i think substack has the goods one of the big reasons i jumped over so first off in in like marketing terms you know this as a genius mm -hmm. yourself 
um, subscribers beat followers any day of the week. Of course. Anybody whose inbox you can get into is a hundred times more valuable than some rando following you on Twitter. Right. I mean, like if, if followers on Instagram and Twitter, I've got like 2,500 followers on Instagram, which is decent for like an artist of where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, under a thousand followers on Twitter, uh, which is probably a little further behind than I should be. But regardless, if every one of those people gave me a dollar, you know, the campaign that I'm working on would be, yeah, you know, great. But the funds that I've been able to raise aside from family and friends and stuff like that reflects more of the subscriber list because subscribers convert, right? Yes, they do. So the, one of the big reasons for moving over from um, Webtoon and MailChimp, because uh, MailChimp is how I was running my newsletter. Right. And Webtoon is, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a social network of comics, right? You post and run. Um, was just the appeal of getting into an inbox and building subscribers. And I really do think that as a, as a, you know, a product, they have built something that is not necessarily brand new so much as it's just like really intuitive, you know, it's Mm -hmm. just like, Oh, like if you had like a blog and a newsletter and like your Twitter all rolled into one thing wouldn't that just be like really easy to use it's like yeah it would be and that's just kind of how it is like i just think that it's i don't know if there's going to be like one mega platform like like twitter anymore Mm -hmm. i think that it'll be a little bit more divided up for a while uh but yeah i mean i think that i i don't regret moving over to substack i think that uh it it kind of fits in with what I said, which was, you know, it's just a really good, what the metric I care about is subscribers. And I think that, that as a platform, it's the best one for supporting that. And that as you should, because it's generally at a, at a creator's pace, a source of income. Right. Right. And well, yeah, they've also monetized it um, in a way that I think is a lot more intuitive than um, even like Patreon in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, it's, it's just kind of like a, you know, it's a subscription based thing, like anything else, but people can also like, I haven't even monetized Rona digital express cause I'm not publishing anything right now, but uh, you could go on there and pledge to support it. If I ever turn monetization on. Mm. So, I mean, like there are like little functions like that, that are like, Oh, that's great. So if you were doing a newsletter and you were just, you know, writing your feelings or whatever uh, on whatever beat you care about, And over time, you started building up an audience and you started to notice like, oh man, like, you know, 400 people say they would pay for this newsletter if I turn on monetization. That's, you know, 10 bucks a pop or whatever. That's a salary, right? So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty nice. Um, So yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate Substack. I'm, I'm going to try out other stuff too. Like I'll try to put, I don't think Gumroad is really what it used to be, but no um yeah i've got a couple one shots i might put on like global comics um i'm thinking about doing doing... phenomenal things yeah 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 i'm I'm excited about what they're doing for sure um i don't know if it's good for like a serialized comic but for like one-offs or or whatever uh totally yeah um in print is kind of a new thing that's that's rolled around uh where i think artists can basically just open up a shop and like put and i've got you know, dozens of drawings of Spider-Man and whatever else that I've worked on over the years. So if I could put, you know, 50 of those on an imprint shop an imprint, basically just, you know, they, they will, if you go on and you order a print of something that I put on there, you get the print in the mail and I get money from that. And I didn't have to set up a website and obviously imprint takes their cut and that's how it works, but it basically just handles printing, printing and mailing to people who want prints. So I'm going to look into that, see if that's a viable thing. Uh, so yeah, always diversify, always try the new things and see if they're going to, their work for you. And, um, and yeah, just stick with what works. And yeah, I think Substack is still a good home base for me for now. No, I, I agree. I think Substack is doing a phenomenal job with just having the ability to embolden creators. Regardless. Have you looked have you looked into it at all for yourself? Because I know they do the audio component too, but I don't know about video. And I know that YouTube's kind of a big thing with you. I have. I, I've looked at that component as well because there, there is the opportunity to, to of course, uh, provide that audio function to Substack myself aside from doing YouTube. So that way, at least there's, there's three different channels of visibility. 
right yeah yeah why not yeah, definitely so brother i appreciate you uh joining me once again uh for anybody out there uh there is a good uh few days left of tower of death that is live on kickstarter uh it, it ends what this weekend yeah it'll end at the end of may so probably like next i don't know is that next tuesday next monday or tuesday or something like that yes sir uh, yeah. Right. And the, the important thing is, is there's, there's limited tiers for, uh, so I don't typically do commissions, mm -hmm. uh, but I did throw in a couple of tiers where I will draw something, uh, like hand draw something and throw that in with your, uh, your winnings. So there are, it's limited. I'm not, that's not like, you know, open-ended, uh, because mm -hmm. I have to be able to, to do it, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's some stuff in there like that, that I don't typically do otherwise to, sweeten the deal let's say absolutely great news so for myself james Ware, mass effects voice renton hockey tower of death ronin digital express substack go check that out we are out